we will be looking at the Module 15 Graphic Organizer for Ecology. Please locate your Graphic Organizer at the end of Module 15 in your Student Handbook. Let's begin by defining the term ecology. You have a place to define the term ecology at the top of your Graphic Organizer. Ecology is the study of relationships between living things and the non-living environment. We will begin our study of ecology by looking at how our living environment is organized. We call the living environment the biosphere. If you think of the earth as an apple, the biosphere is kind of like the skin of the apple. It's the area on earth where life exists. This is best understood by taking a look at the diagram that is on the slide and is on your graphic organizer. So we're going to start at the top right corner of that diagram by labeling the picture of the earth biosphere. And you will recall that this is just like the skin of the apple, the area from the depths of the ocean to where birds are able to fly the highest in the atmosphere, where life exists. The biosphere is broken down into biomes. So label that on the second line, showing the area that is highlighted in a darker color of the earth. The biomes are large areas with similar climate and similar vegetation. For example, we live in the deciduous forest biome. Other biomes are the desert, the tundra, tropical rainforest, the taiga, and so forth. Biomes are then divided into ecosystems. So coming straight down from your label of the biomes, you will see a place to label the word ecosystem. The ecosystem represents all of the living organisms in a particular place as well as their non-living factors that they interact with. The living components of an ecosystem are called biotic factors. There's a place to define that at the bottom of the box on organization of the biosphere. Biotic factors are the living parts of an ecosystem. So that's all the animals, all of the plants, all of the bacteria, protists, and fungi that live in a particular area. The abiotic factors, right in that definition as well, are the non-living components of the ecosystem. So that's the soil, the rocks, the water, the sunlight, the precipitation, the humidity, the wind, all of the abiotic components are the non-living components. Ecosystems can then be further subdivided into communities. If you look down at the bottom of the picture, on the next circle in, you have a place to label the communities. Communities are the living components of the ecosystem. So you can see the trees, you can see the rabbits, and you can see the shrubs, and you can see the owls, and you can see the beavers, and all other sorts of living communities in that particular ecosystem. Moving inward again, we have a population. Populations are members of a particular species that are living together in the same place at the same time and interacting with one another. So in this picture, we see a population of elk. And then the final picture to label is one individual, an organism. One individual of a population represents a living organism. So we're starting with a big area, the biosphere, moving to a much smaller component, the living organism. 
Just below the section for the organization of the biosphere, you will see the statement, every organism has a specific niche. We need to define the term niche. The niche is the organism's role in the ecosystem. So write in that definition. You also want to write in that this would include their habitat, or where they live, their place in the food web, that would include what they eat and what eats them, as well as into any interrelationships that that organism may have with other organisms in that ecosystem. Let's look at a picture to help you understand the idea of the niche. In this picture, you have a spruce tree, which is divided into zones. The zones represent the different parts of the tree that the warbler species shown can inhabit. The Cape May warbler likes the top branches. The bay-breasted warbler likes the one in the middle. The yellow-rumped warbler likes the ones at the bottom. So while their habitat is the same, they all live in a spruce tree, they divide up that spruce tree to share it in a sense. So each of them has a slightly different niche. One of the most important processes that takes place in the living community and part of the non-living community is the transfer of energy. The reason I say the non-living community is that it begins with the ecosystem's ultimate source of energy. You have a place to write that in. The ultimate source of energy is the sun. The sun then moves to the producers. The producers use the solar energy to make food and then the consumers eat the producers or maybe even, even other consumers to get food. So each step in this process, from the sun to the grass, from the grass to the mouse, from the mouse to the snake, and from the snake to the hawk, is called a trophic level. You have a place to write that in as well. Moves through trophic levels. Trophic levels are levels of feeding. We can represent the movement of energy in an ecosystem in a food web. We can also represent this in an ecological pyramid, which we will be looking at in a moment. Notice that in the food web, at the bottom, we have the producers, because that is the base of the food web. They are the ones that are able to capture the ultimate source of energy, the sun, and they hold up the rest of the food web. Without the producers, nothing has food. Notice that the arrows in the food web show the direction of the energy transfer. It's going from the producers to the primary consumers, which are also called herbivores from the herbivores to the secondary consumers or tertiary consumers or quaternary consumers, which are all carnivores. Notice that those arrows do not loop back around. Energy only moves in one direction. It is not recycled. Energy is not recycled. Energy moves from the sun to the producers to the consumers and then it changes forms. Let's fill in the ecological pyramid to show the transfer of energy in a food web. Starting at the base with the most energy, write in the word producers. The next trophic level are the primary consumers also called herbivores. The next trophic level are the secondary consumers, 
And the final trophic level are the tertiary consumers, which would have the least available energy. The secondary and tertiary consumers are examples of carnivores. Now you will notice that as you go up the pyramid, the lines representing the different trophic levels get smaller, and that's why it looks like a pyramid. This shows you the idea of ecological efficiency. Only about 10% of the available energy in one trophic level is passed to the next trophic level. And you have a place to write in that 10% rule. Only 10% of the available energy is passed to the next trophic level. So the producers pass along 10% of their available energy to the primary consumers. The other 90% is said to be lost. But we put lost in quotation marks because it's not gone. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can change forms. So when those producers are growing, respiring, reproducing, manufacturing food, they are doing biological work. They are using the energy from the sun in order to be able to do this. We say that this energy is lost because as it's used, it's converted to heat. You have a place to record this information as well. Where is the lost energy? The lost energy is used for biological work, such as eating, growing, respiring, and is converted to heat. Heat is a more dispersed form of energy that cannot be used in the food web. As I said, in a food web, energy cannot be recycled. It moves from one trophic level to the next, ultimately much of it escaping as heat. However, matter can be recycled. So let's look at the cycling of matter and the role of decomposers in this recycling. You have a place to write down some information about decomposers under the cycling of matter. Decomposers break down wastes and dead organisms. In doing so, nutrients from these wastes and from the dead organisms are returned to the soil where they can be reused by plants. Examples of decomposers are bacteria, fungi, and some invertebrate animals, such as worms. You can see in the picture the transfer of energy from the sun to the producers, producers to primary consumers, primary consumers to secondary consumers, secondary consumers to tertiary consumers, and then from all levels, the transfer to the decomposers. All of this matter is then recycled going back to the grass. We call the cycles of recycling matter biogeochemical cycles because we learn how matter moves through life and the earth and chemicals. So let's start by looking at the water cycle, which you have previously learned about in earth science. So we won't spend much time here on the water cycle. Let's start by simply writing in some important terms pertaining to the water cycle. Begin with precipitation. You can see this in the diagram. Precipitation leads to runoff. Then we have evaporation and condensation. All of this represents the movement of water in a particular ecosystem. Next, we have the nitrogen cycle. The nitrogen cycle is down at the bottom of the chart. Make sure that you are writing this information in the right place. The nitrogen cycle is very complex. 
but you don't know, need to know about the complexities of it. You simply need to know the following information. Organisms like us and other living things need nitrogen to build proteins. And there is plenty of nitrogen in the atmosphere. The problem is we can't use that nitrogen. So bacteria called nitrogen fixing bacteria, which live in the soil and in the roots of certain types of plants, fix that nitrogen and turn it into a form that we can use and that plants can use. Other types of bacteria break up that nitrogen as animals and plants and their wastes are decomposed and the nitrogen can be returned to the atmosphere. So in your graphic organizer, you may simply record bacteria fix nitrogen so that it is in a usable form for living organisms. Next, we need to look at the carbon cycle. And we need to have a little bit more of a detailed look at the carbon cycle. Each of these pieces of bullet pointed information are important for you to record in your graphic organizer. So let's go ahead and record that information first and then we will talk about the picture you're seeing here. The carbon cycle is driven by photosynthesis and cellular respiration, processes you have previously learned about. Decomposition is actually a form of cellular respiration. When fossil fuels are burned because they are the remains of living organisms, they can add carbon dioxide gas to the atmosphere. And when trees are cut down, deforestation, they are unable to take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. All of that is important for you to record. So now look at the picture. We have the sun. We see that the plant is using the sun for photosynthesis. In order to do that, the plant has to take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So that's the first form of carbon that we see, carbon dioxide. The plant converts that carbon dioxide to glucose, a different molecule containing carbon. That glucose is then consumed by living organisms like the cow. As the cow and the plant and any other living organism respires, they release carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. You can see that represented by the red arrow. You will also see that as plants and animals decay, following the blue arrow downward, that those can be compressed and turned into fossil fuels over time. Those fossil fuels like oil, coal, and natural gas can be burned, that's called combustion. And the combustion can release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Again, you can see that by the red arrow. We also have atmospheric carbon dioxide going down into oceans and diffusing into the water. You can see that by the blue arrow on the far left side. Similarly, carbon dioxide can diffuse from oceans back to the atmosphere. You can see that by the red arrow coming from the ocean to the atmosphere. Let's take a look at how living organisms interact with one another in a community. You have a section on your graphic organizer in the lower left corner titled Community Interactions. There are several types of community interactions, including competition, predation, and symbiosis. 
The first community interaction is competition. You have a space to write in a definition for competition, a struggle for resources such as food or space or abiotic factors like the sun or a mate. All of these are things that organisms may compete with one another for. For example, in the picture on the right, you can see the trees and other plants competing for sunlight. The owls that are shown on the branch, or are those just birds, are going to be competing for things like nesting space, food that they need to eat, a mate so that they can reproduce. The second community interaction is predation. You have a space to define predation. Some organisms, called predators, consume other organisms, called prey. You have pictures showing a snake eating a frog. The snake is the predator, the frog is the prey. But what you may not realize is the tortoise shown in the bottom picture, is also a predator. His prey is the plant he is consuming. The last type of community interaction is symbiosis. Don't write the definition in the box. Write the definition below the box. A close, permanent relationship between two organisms that is not predation or competition. There are three types of symbiosis, which you will record beside the bullet points in the box. The first is mutualism, which we can abbreviate as plus plus. The bee and the flower represent mutualism because both of these organisms benefit from the relationship. The bee gains food, the flower gets pollinated. The second relationship is parasitism, which we can abbreviate plus minus because one organism benefits and the other is harmed. The picture shown is mistletoe. The mistletoe is benefiting from the tree. It doesn't have a vascular system, so it is taking water from the tree. This actually hurts the tree but probably doesn't kill it. Commensalism, we can abbreviate plus zero or plus neutral. One organism benefits, the other one doesn't care. The shark and the remora are an example. The shark doesn't care that the remora are tagging along, getting food from the scraps that he's leaving behind. Now let's take a look at population growth in a community of organisms. Remember that populations are members of the same species living in a particular place at a particular time and interacting with one another. We're going to label some graphs to show the typical patterns of population growth in these organisms. So start with the one labeled J-curve. You can probably tell that it's called a J-curve because of its shape. You need to label the axes of this graph. The x-axis is time, the y-axis is the number of organisms. You can see how it takes a little time for the population to become established. It doesn't grow very rapidly at first. But then as it starts to go up, it continues to go up very quickly in a short period of time the number of organisms increases dramatically in a short period of time. This is called exponential growth, and you need to label that on the graph. The rapid growth in a short period of time is exponential growth. This is what occurs when populations are becoming established. This is what occurs when there are plentiful resources in a population. But at some point, the number of resources begins to have some effect on the growth of the population. 
This population growth can be represented as an S-curve. Again, you can see that it's called an S-curve because of its shape. You need to label the axes of this graph, time on the x-axis, number of organisms on the y-axis. You'll see a dotted line at the top. The dotted line represents the carrying capacity of a particular environment. You need to label that. The carrying capacity is the maximum number of individuals an environment can support. The carrying capacity of an environment is dynamic. It is not a fixed number. The carrying capacity can fluctuate depending on a lot of different factors. For example, if there's a drought, then the carrying capacity for herbivores may decrease because there's less vegetation for them to eat. So what you can see by looking at the growth curve is again, it takes a while for the population to become established. Then there is a period of exponential growth. But as the population size approaches the carrying capacity, it begins to level off. This is what typically happens in a population of organisms. The factors that define the carrying capacity, that establish the carrying capacity, are called limiting factors. These are factors that limit the size of a population. You have a space on your graphic organizer to differentiate between density dependent factors and density independent factors. Density dependent factors exert more of an impact when the population density is high, when there are a lot of individuals in a particular place. So having less food to go around would be a density dependent factor. Diseases, because if there are more individuals, they are interacting with each other in closer proximity, leading to the spread of disease. When there are more individuals, there might be more opportunities to find a mate. If there are fewer individuals, then there might be fewer opportunities to, to find a mate. Either way, these are factors that are density dependent. So please record some examples on your graphic organizer. On the other hand, things like natural disasters, a forest fire for example, are density independent. In other words, it doesn't matter how dense the population is. There may be a few individuals in a given space or a lot of individuals in a given space. These factors exert their impact regardless of the number of individuals. It is important to understand that real life does not look as neat as a textbook. So looking at your S-curve graph, you will see that the line neatly levels off as carrying capacity is approached. Actually, populations fluctuate around that carrying capacity. You can see on the slide the section labeled B, which has slightly overshot the carrying capacity. When populations overshoot their carrying capacity, they are generally going to begin to die back. So you can see how the population declines. Now it is under the carrying capacity, so the population will begin to grow again. There is a slight overshoot followed by decline. This is called dynamic equilibrium because while in general terms the population size is stabilized, it does fluctuate around that carrying capacity. Just as populations change over time, communities, entire communities of organisms also change over time. Recall that a community are all of the living parts of an ecosystem, the plants, the animals, etc. The process of the change in communities over time is called secession. You have a space to define secession in the bottom right corner of your graphic organizer. Secession is defined as communities changing over time in a predictable orderly way, and this may take many, many decades. So let's look at an example. Let's say you have an abandoned farm field. The farmer stops planting the field with crops, so you're left with a bare field of dirt. 
The first plants that are going to begin to colonize, or the pioneers, so to speak, are the annual plants, the plants like dandelions that only live a year at a time. Eventually, we will start to see some perennial plants like grasses that come back year after year. If you come to that field after several years, you may see some shrubs or even some small trees popping up. If you come back to that field after 10 or 20 years, you may see some softwood trees such as pines covering the field. And if you come back to that field after 100 years, it will no longer be a field at all. It will be a hardwood forest. Over time, that community of plants has changed in a predictable orderly way. One group of plants makes changes that leads to the change in the community. And the animal communities follow the changes in the plant communities because they depend on the plants.